So yes, this year um, marks 10 years of student housing cooperatives in the UK. Um, so it is very exciting, um, but it's also um, still very new. Um, cooperatives are therefore not known widely, I'd say. It's quite still quite niche in the UK, especially among the student market. Um, I remember doing Freshers' Fairs um, in Brighton, and I'd say nine out of 10 of the people we spoke to had never heard of a cooperative, or they had, I suppose, very uh, specific ideas about what it might mean. Uh, lots of people thought it was a commune where they had to surrender all their finances and things like that. Um, so I think those kind of conversations really early on were interesting in just highlighting um, how co-ops aren't uh, yet a mainstream answer. And we really want to shift that um, into the mainstream landscape. Um, these are a couple of uh, pictures from Birmingham. So as you can see, uh, really, it's about bringing people together. Uh, the photo at the bottom uh, is something that for most students is just not even a possibility. The idea of growing vegetables, being in a property long enough to see through the seasons, get, getting a greenhouse and things like that. Um, it's really where co-ops come into um, their own. So the story of student co-op homes, um, students and cooperative cooperators came together from various different activist groups uh, and cooperative groups. So that might be uh, groups that formed against tuition fees, food cooperatives, bike co-ops, to form Student Co-op Homes, which was established in March 2018. And this was to focus on growing the student housing co-op movement in the UK and thus tackling the, the housing crisis. And I know Anke is going to touch on this uh, later as well in her presentation. We're also inspired from nearly 100 years in the US. Um, so the picture at the top right is uh, one of the really famous ones in Berkeley in California. And I actually visited there um, nearly 20 years ago before I knew what a cooperative was. Um, it's very similar, I suppose, to the Edinburgh Co-op. Um, and at that time, it just really struck me how well organised it was. Everyone was taking on different roles within the co-op. And I was, yeah, I remember just asking a lot of questions, trying to work out what this structure was and why these students uh, were living in this way that was so different from, I suppose, more of a passive housing uh, experience where people kind of expect everything to be done for them. Whereas in co-ops, it's very much an active process about people problem solving and coming up with creative ideas for living in the best way possible. Um, and I think that's where it's really inspiring. Um, student Co-op Homes launched a share offer um, in 2019, and they raised over £300,000. So that's people who support the idea of housing co-ops, uh, who want to put their money into a project that will have a good social impact. Um, and that has really enabled us uh, to get moving. Um, obviously, with COVID and various other things happening, it's been a lot slower than we anticipated. Um, that just kind of slowed things down for at least a couple of years. Um, but yeah, uh, now we're looking at, as I say, 10 years since Birmingham and Edinburgh opened their doors. So the pictures on the left are of Birmingham. Um, and Student Co-op Homes has actually been in the fortuitous position that we've now been able to buy this property from Mid Counties Cooperative. So we own this property and we lease it to Birmingham Student Housing Co-op and they've got it on a seven year lease. And then Edinburgh, that Amro has just been talking about, uh, leased their property from Castle Rock, which is a housing association. And all the student co-ops in the UK lease from another party. So whether it's uh, student co-op homes in the case of Birmingham, housing association, uh, CESOL uh, lease from a community land trust, so that enables the students then to access the property um, and have a secure way um, of, yeah, of managing it, basically. Uh, on the right, you can see the basement. If anyone's been lucky to see Edinburgh, this is definitely one of the most um, incredible features of their building. It used to be a carport, uh, an empty grey basement space. Uh, and that was probably one of the first things they noticed, that this could be used in a much more creative way. So they, I remember going to visit actually and the students had learned uh, how to put floor, flooring down um, and they'd actually reused some flooring that they'd inherited from one of their old schools. So they'd done that. A couple of them had learned how to do some plumbing. It was just so inspirational and they can then use that space as a community and event space. So they've run training, various different events in there. 
they've obviously the outside they've got loads of plants growing uh they've got a massive bike shed um and you know they're really able to say these are the things that we need and how can we best do that so it's just a real catalyst for um exciting ideas and obviously with the scale um of edinburgh it's just you know 106 students uh obviously just creates a lot of exciting opportunities um so yeah, just to give you a bit more information about Student Co-op Homes, it's a multi-stakeholder hybrid cooperative, um, which was founded in March 2018 to facilitate the growth of the UK student housing co-op movement. And we are very much student-led. We have two stakeholders. Uh, we have user members who are the student housing cooperatives who have 75% of the votes on our, and investor supporter members, which are made up of individual and corporate members. And we have almost 170 of those. Um, in the last 18 months, uh, the number of student housing co-ops in the UK um, has more than doubled. Um, and you can see here from this image, the ones with the little houses are where the, there are properties. So Edinburgh, Sheffield, Birmingham and Cecil in Brighton. And then there's lots of other groups um, all around and they are popping up um, kind of continuously. We've got, you know, murmurs from groups in Dundee and various other places. And I think the nice thing now is you know, other students see groups and get inspiration and think, oh, this can work. Maybe we can do this as well. Um, and obviously, the more uh, rents go up and everything, people are starting to realise that actually this is a really good um, solution. So our mission is to create a thriving and large scale student housing cooperative movement. And we act as a federation of all student housing co-ops in the UK. And we also aim to generate funds to extend the range of properties available for co-ops to rent. Um, so, yeah, I've already mentioned about how our structure enables the student housing co-ops to have the majority say. Um, so, these, yeah, these are the four co-ops with properties, Birmingham, Edinburgh, Sheffield and Seasalt in Brighton. Um, I actually, before I worked for student uh, co-op homes, I worked for Seasalt for three and a half years. Um, and, yeah, that's how long it took from forming the group to getting the property. Um, we were lucky in the sense that the Community Land Trust had basically got some funding at the same time and we were able to access lots of training um, and really just get expertise like architects who could come and say, oh, you could take this wall down and do this. Um, for people who aren't working in that sector, obviously that kind of decision-making would be quite intimidating. So that gave uh, students uh, and our group a real confidence boost that yeah, we can actually do this. Um, but even for them, because it was all so new, uh, there was lots of areas where, you know, we were all kind of just trying to learn as we went. Um, so it was definitely a steep learning curve. Um, we put in planning permission. We had to wait for months and months. Students seem to fall into this kind of grey box where they aren't eligible for social housing. Um, so they're often deemed as not being in need. Um, so that can sometimes restrict the funding that we could get or even just, you know, be able to like, get involved in those conversations in community-led housing and I think there was a lot of work done by the students in Brighton um, just to kind of like really raise the awareness of actually there are students who need this and how much of an empowering um, opportunity it is so we really need to be doing more um, nationally to kind of raise that um, awareness. Um, yeah so uh, there's as I say a lot, all of these groups have set up through various different partnerships some of the common challenges at the beginning were access to capital. Um, so the Land Trust in Brighton did a share offer at a similar time as Student Co-op Homes, and they raised a similar amount, over 300000 Obviously, that takes a massive amount of capacity to raise all of that money. Um, it's also very difficult for students with no you know, financial track record to be able to access capital or even have that credibility. There's a massive perception of risk, and there's also... You know, we've had some groups form uh, and then because of the natural turnover of students, an initial very committed group, if they all leave and they don't get the new students along, groups often disband as well. So there's a real need to kind of try and catalyze these groups a lot quicker. Um, and yeah, that's something with student housing cops you generally struggle with. And then things like passing on the information and not making sure that it's not lost because, yeah, the turnover is so high. So some of the benefits of student housing co-ops um, are obviously it gives people more autonomy. Uh, they have longer term tenancies. So rather than people having to move every single year, they can stay for the duration of their studies. A lot of people stay for a year after they've graduated. 
um, which obviously is much more stable. But again, as I've highlighted, it just means that there's just more time to get for people to get involved in things. Um, they're democratic in the way that they're organised. They're more affordable. So, you know, the money goes back into it, reinvesting the property. Communities are massive focus as well. Um, there's a the photo at the bottom is the Friday night dinner uh, in Birmingham, which the students have been doing for years, actually. Um, and they kind of open their doors for people in the community as well. Um, and that's just a really nice way just to like come together over food. Um, also, yeah, as I mentioned, they have longer term projects such as growing vegetables and creative student led design. So they converted their garage to an extra room. Obviously, we've seen the stuff, some of the things that Edinburgh have done as well. Um, and yeah, I suppose one of the biggest benefits is it's a real chance for problem solving. So whether it's something to do with a creative, um, yeah, creative uh, solution or um, finances, there's just so many different aspects um, to student housing co-ops. And I think that's one of the most interesting things. So you might have a student, it, it doesn't matter what they're studying, there'll always be something they can apply um, to the housing co-op, which I think is really interesting. Um, they're also a really transformative experience and a catalyst for change. So various different students who've been involved and lived in student housing co-ops have gone on to do different things. So setting up workers co-ops, setting up other housing co-ops. There's also a young cooperators network, which has been set up by uh, at least a couple of students in Edinburgh. And yeah, they now run a, I think it's May this like 25th, 26th of May this year, um, which is a funded trip in Liverpool. So, you know, there's more of these things happening now uh, because people have kind of experienced the benefits of living in a housing co-op. Um, the one on the right uh, is an image uh, that Tom Green did, who's one of the students who did loads of social media for CESOL. Um, and it is this idea of, well, what if we can uh, have a student housing co-op in every university city? And, you know, what can that really do to transform um, the housing market? Um, this is an example from CESOL in Brighton. So again this just shows you know a lot of students do care about sustainability and these are the sorts of changes that if they're given that um yeah that influence to run their own housing what sort of things uh, we can expect to see so they worked with a local co-op a local energy co-op uh, besco and they then were able to assess things that they could install so things like heat pumps insulation triple glazing, underfloor heating, things that are like unheard of in most student housing, which is obviously just normally very mouldy, um, you know, cold and damp and all of these things. And it's actually saying, well, no, students should be living in good quality accommodation. And these are real opportunities um, to change that. Um, yeah, so also they were landscaping to so have a wildlife friendly garden. And reinvesting some of the rent, um, which could help subsidise green initiatives. They won uh, Young Cooperators of the Year um, in 2022, which is by the Confederation of Cooperative Housing. So as you can see, there's a real opportunity for students to get together, come up with some really great ideas and actually um, make them happen. Um, that's just an overview into how uh, the structure of Student Co-op Homes works. Um, so we are run by a board of directors, which is made up of students, uh, user members with 75% of the votes and also investor supporter members as well. And then we're open to have volunteers who come um, and get involved in various different groups as well. So some of the current challenges uh, we have at Student Co-op Homes at the moment, and most of them are actually financial, um, but high interest rates. So in the last 18 months, Interest rates have gone from 4.75 to 7.04%, which is obviously a massive hike. Um, Ecology Building Society, who've always been very amenable uh, to um, eco renovations and various, you know, they understand the co op movement, which not all high street lenders do. They paused all their applications and then reduced the mortgage loan from 40 to 30 years. Um, so, that obviously, things like that have a massive impact. Um, I know Glasgow are going to be talking soon as well. Um, and yeah, we're working to try and get a property for Glasgow. But again, it's such a competitive property market at the moment. We put an offer in um, and we were only 12 out of 15. Um, and we put in quite a bit over the offer price that was recommended. So again, we're kind of taking a step back and thinking we can't we can't necessarily um, be we're not going to always going to be successful in 
the property market. So we need to look at more creative solutions to this. Are there empty buildings? Are there buildings we can lease from various different groups? And I know Glasgow um, are in conversations about a mixed use space at the moment. Um, so that's just to highlight that there are other create more creative ways maybe of making this movement happen. And it's all about creating these partnerships together, really. Um, and yeah, because I guess this um, clear there's questions that we don't have the answers to yet so for example um there's been a hike in um suitable properties so we're now finding that any property really that we need that we want to consider of a suitable size is probably going to be over five hundred thousand. we don't know if we're going to be liable for additional tax um and basically that means that we might need a new structure so there's all of these kind of questions as well um that are coming up that we're working with um other questions and challenges in terms of design so everybody wants accessible properties um but this is something that's really limited so CESOL uh, worked to get a ramp so their property was more accessible but most of the properties um all of the other ones it's they're just not accessible because of the way they're built and um, so that's something that kind of keeps coming up and obviously new builds enable properties to be designed with um those access needs in mind so I think that's something uh, to kind of keep at the back of your minds as well. But there are lots of opportunities. As I've said, there's so much demand. Or oh, These are the groups on the right um, without properties. So you can see there's just a lot of groups all across the country. We know the model works, you know, NASCO, which is the North American model. Uh, there's a now a pan-European student housing co-op movement as well. We've got new partnerships. So we've been talking to the Church of England, for example, um, and about a potential building in Birmingham. We're also working with the NUS and the SU uh, to create an affiliation there. And as I've said, there's lots of creative ideas and you know an increasing number of events like this. So I think there is still lots of potential, even though uh, there are some challenges. So yeah, we've been really inspired um, from the wider movement. So yeah, I've mentioned NASCO already. Co-ops UK uh, gave Student Co-op Homes quite a lot of funding in the early days, the first three years. And then the Confederation of Cooperative Housing. So that's across the UK. Um, we've obviously got loads of examples from projects that have worked there. Um, there was a trip uh, last September, a uh, funded trip that some of the students went on uh, to Geneva and Zurich. Um, and that was really exciting because it just kind of demonstrates um, how, yeah, student housing can be really exciting. Um, so they worked in collaboration with Studentendorf, who are based in Germany, La Segu in Switzerland, um, and Urbermond. And they basically have been, yeah, doing really exciting student housing co-ops for years. So I think that was really inspiring just to go there and see that these things actually can happen. Um, obviously, the landscape in the UK is very different, um, but I think these sorts of um, trips just help to galvanise the excitement and momentum and keep people going. Because it is, I guess, saying that these projects is long haul, so there's just always a need to kind of make sure to keep up that momentum as people go. Um, this is These are photos from the Brighton Student Housing Co-op Gathering, um, which was held uh, last year in September. And again, this was just lots of students and different cooperators um, from across the country coming together. We also went to the Sea Salt House um, and they hosted a dinner there. So it was just really nice for everyone just to come and see that actually we can get together and kind of start um, yeah, working together to create more student housing co-ops. Um, and that's, that's it, the end. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat>